Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ecom Ops podcast. Guys, today I have a real e-commerce expert. I think Carlos was born with e-commerce shoes on uh, to the show. Hey, Carlos, great to have you. Good morning, Norbert. Have a great day, man. And it's been <laughs> exciting to uh, coming up to the show, the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. I'm so happy to have guests like you. Carlos, um, can you tell me a bit more about yourself and about your company? What are you doing, actually? Yes. Look, I was, uh, I'm an immigrant to the U.S. from Ecuador, of all places. I came to the U.S. at 17 years old, went to college, graduated, got a couple of degrees, and I thought a job was going to be my, my end game, right? A successful <laughs> job at a successful company. But uh, I was in the Silicon Valley right around when the dot-com bubble popped. And uh, a lot of people don't remember that because they're too young. But what happened is there was a crisis, right? The internet was just getting born. E-commerce was just getting born. And uh, I lost my job after working there for five years because companies were shrinking. And the natural step was to try a business. And in those days, eBay was getting started. And I started selling on eBay. I started flipping products. I was doing wholesale, overstock merchandise. And my little business out of my garage started started really uh, booming. And I started buying more merchandise and I started selling more. Back in those days, you know, it was the Wild West. There was no YouTube. There was no advice. <laughs> you just had to try stuff. You just had to do trial and error. So I did. And I learned a lot. And, you know, I became one of the biggest eBay sellers in the world, then migrated to Amazon because Amazon started taking over, learned the Amazon game, learned how to sell product there. And eventually I flipped from going with the wholesale overstock merchandise to private label and having my own brands. And, you know, that's when my business really took off and, and uh, I was able to build several brands and I was able to sell an eight figure brand uh, not too long ago, about a couple of years ago. And after that, you know, I still have a logistics business out of that e-commerce experience uh, back in those days. And the people are going to think this is strange, but uh, nobody, nobody could fulfill our products. It was not like FBA. You would send to FBA. They would do it for you. You had to ship your own stuff. So yeah. I, I, that forced me to set up my own logistics company, buy my own warehouse, have my own facility which I still have today and we service about 300 e-commerce brands in the 3PL fulfillment logistics company. So out of this little garage eBay business, four other very successful companies were born. The eight figure exit was, was born out of there. And um, after I had some of that capital, I started investing in real estate. So now I'm a full-time multifamily real estate investor here in the US and we've been able to multiply that capital quite a bit in the last few years. So that's a little bit of my story in a- Oh, well, but this is short. such, I love such <laughs> such stories, really. This is so great uh, to see people that started with e-commerce, growing their brands, growing the business into, yeah, eight-figure companies. Um, and, and then finally, yeah, um, sell the company or, or do something that they really love or like. And, and this is really great to hear. I mean, uh, that, that I, there are really a lot of questions coming up now. So um, I, I want to learn a, a bit more about uh, how was eBay and Amazon before. So we, we know it as it is now. Yeah. And a lot of people that are listening to the podcast know what they need to do and how to deal with Amazon and eBay or don't. So what changed? And the other hand is why exactly did you go into, uh, into, into real estate from yeah. e-commerce? What could you learn from e-commerce in, in real estate? So let, let's start with. Um, start with the first thing. So how was that time for you uh, being one of the early adopters selling on marketplaces? Yeah, look, when we started on eBay, we started understanding that there was very little competition, right? So being early to the party is very advantageous. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is not necessarily with, uh, with a platform, but even with a product. A lot of people know that, you know, if, if you find somebody in something that sells, if you're one of the first few that are start selling that product, you can have success because you gain momentum. So for me, it was, hey, let's try this new e-commerce platform called eBay, which back then, man, everybody was saying, no, you know, that's like a garage sale website, like a flea market, <laughs> you know, e-commerce is not going to stick. 
people have to go try the stuff at the store and they have to actually touch it and feel it before they buy it. There was a lot of uh, naysayers about it, just like any new technology. But for me, it was working because since I had connections with Hewlett Packard, the company that I was working in, I was buying merchandise at a very good cost. And then I would post it online and I'll tell you specifically what it was. My first product was toner cartridges, was laser mm -hmm. or toner cartridges. And I was able to buy them very inexpensive and then sell them for a good discount compared to the retail store. So people were buying them like crazy. And that's really when I saw success. And I said, look, if it works for this one product, it has to work for more products. Yeah. So, you know, I, 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 I bet everything on it. I, I cashed out my retirement fund that I had accumulated in the five years that I worked for Hewlett Packard. I maxed out my credit cards. You know, I was single, so I, I figured, you know, I have nothing to lose. If, if anything, I can always go get another job, but let me go and try to do this thing. And, you know, I was glad I took the risk because the business started growing. Uh, eBay started taking off big time. It was the dominant player in those days before Amazon really took hold. And, um, so uh, for a good five years, you know, we made a lot of money on eBay, just flipping product, finding deals of companies that needed to get rid of their excess stock or sometimes even their returns, the returns that were in, you know, new condition, we would buy them really cheap and flip them on the, on the eBay platform. And then of mm -hmm. course, uh, big brother, uh, Amazon came around and started doing a better job in my opinion than, than eBay in terms of user experience because you know Amazon's the king of that it started making it really easy for people to save their credit card and order on repeat and doing things like that so I started seeing that and I started looking at hey let's let's also post on eBay let's uh, I'm sorry let's also post on Amazon and we started diverting our attention to Amazon and there was a period of time when I remember when you would do a Google search eBay will always come at the top, right? It was yeah. always at the top. Yeah. I think I think this was back in 2010. eBay was always at the top. And then one Q4 season, one the you know, the, the last quarter of the year is always the strongest for e-commerce. And one Q4, it was around September or October when eBay disappeared from the Google search. Something happened amongst Google and eBay. And of course, the owner of the internet, Google, decided to suppress eBay from the search. And our eBay sales just tanked. And we were like, what is happening, right? And everybody else that is in this industry started asking themselves, what's happening? And, you know, something happened where eBay was probably the biggest spender in Google search uh, uh, back in those days, and they just couldn't get to a deal. So Google did what they did, and they put the eBay, eBay results in the third, fourth page. And you know what happened after that, right? Sales dropped and then Amazon started taking off big time. So that gave Amazon a huge swing. So my attention went from, you know, probably 90% eBay, 10% Amazon to, okay, let's go Amazon full time. And we still kept our eBay business, but it became, you know, a much smaller part of our business and Amazon really started taking off. And we started focusing on that. And, you know, back in those days, you didn't have to do much. You just had to have a clean listing. You had to have a good product, good price. We were competing mostly on those days on price, right? If yep. you bought the product for a good price and you could sell it for a good price, then you would sell a lot. And, uh, you know, over time in the last decade or so, since then, you know, things have changed greatly because now you have to compete not only on price, but also on quality and customer service, making sure you have good systems, making sure that uh, you have a product that it differentiates from others. And, you know, over time, that's what happened in that space. Wow, that's 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 the entire story. I think we don't need even more. No, it's it's absolutely it's great. Um, and and I, I need to fully agree with uh, So you're from the US. Uh, I'm here in Europe. Uh, but it's literally the same. So um, um, eBay, eBay was one of the biggest and strongest players in that game. Uh, and finally, also here, it dropped off. So um, I'm here in Austria. Um, 
it's 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 not that much relevant anymore uh, here mm-hmm. um, to to buy on eBay, uh, but Amazon is of course, and I think in the uh, Q4 season or the the the, the Xmas season especially, um, there there are statistics that say like um, uh, 50% of the 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 online uh, um, revenue for the Xmas presents is placed on Amazon. Yeah, and that's huge. That's really really huge. Um, for me, it would be also interesting. You're now in a completely different, yeah, um, um, industry. How, how does it help you the the experience you did in e-commerce to 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 grow your business here in the real estate market? Yeah, so it, it was interesting, right? Uh, us e-commerce sellers become hackers in a way, right? We're always tweaking yep. things. We're always pivoting. You know, if our picture is not converting, we change it. And if if our if our copy in our listings is not converted, we change it and we modify and we are always trying to look for that little edge that will give us another, you know, 5%, 10% conversion or click through rate or anything else. So it's very much data driven and we don't settle for just an average, an average listing or an average product or anything else. So when I, when I built my e-commerce businesses and I was telling you earlier that I sold a supplement company that I launched on Amazon, I had two big problems. The first problem is I had capital. For the first time, I had larger amounts of capital that I needed to reinvest and I needed to put to work. And I realized at that point that I had learned how to make money on e-commerce and I was always reinvesting into my business. But it got to that point when you have a big exit I was like, this is, I don't need this much money in my business, right? What do I do with this capital? And I learned that I had made the money. I learned how to save the money. But one thing I did not learn how to do is invest the money. And uh, that's something that they don't even teach us in school. So I started going on a journey of what's the best asset class out there? What's the best investment out there that I can put my money work without having me to do as much work as I did building these businesses from scratch and has you know very low risk, but also has great returns. And then the second problem that I had was I was about to pay this big amount in taxes from this exit. And one of the things I discovered is that real estate, especially here in the US, if you live here, has the best tax advantages of any other investment there is. And I'm, and I'm talking by a tenfold, right? That it doesn't even compare with anything else because here in the US, the government promotes for people to invest in, in real estate. And the way they promote it is it has created all kinds of different tax opportunities for people that are willing to go buy in real estate. So that was my decision of, hey, you know, what do I do with this capital? And then since I still have my e-commerce businesses, any extra capital that I have, now I'm putting it on the real estate side. And that really has created an opportunity for me. But as far as skill sets from e-commerce to real estate, it's very much similar. Because when you look at an investment at a property that you want to buy or you want to invest in, is about data, right? You want to know, hey, how much is it, how much is it cash flowing, right? What are the expenses like? What, uh, what is the income? Can I change a couple things to make more money? Can I start charging tenants for things that right now the property's paying? And in real estate, in commercial real estate, which is what I invest in, every dollar that you put to the bottom line translates into $20 of value for the business. So the wow. value, the valuation is huge, right? So just think about it. If, for example, I buy an apartment complex that has 50 units and the property was paying for the internet service of the tenants and spending $50 a month per tenant. If I'm able to, over time, push that back to the tenants so that everybody pays their own internet, I'm, I'm, I'm recovering $50 per tenant and that becomes back to the bottom line. So I'm forcing the value of the property by a lot, by every dollar. Remember, every dollar that I put on that bottom line translates into $20 of value. So with just 50 units, and I love to do this math because this is what got me into this business, is $50 times 50 units 
That's just twenty five hundred dollars extra a month that I'm that I'm that I'm putting on the bottom line, right? But if you do that by twelve, that's thirty thousand dollars a year of extra profit. And like I said, every dollar is twenty dollars. That's six hundred thousand dollars of value that I'm increasing of that one property with one thing. So that's, that's why insane. Really yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, I, I can absolutely hear you go why you, why you, you, why you put it into that. And I think it's also something that you um, needed to learn uh, from 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 e-commerce or did learn in e-commerce um, uh, that the mass uh, of of buying products gives you a lower price. Yeah, uh, you can have a better margin. So it's actually a similar translation act, uh, in, in 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 the real estate case. Totally. Right? The other thing yeah. too is. Look, we all have heard in e-commerce, the holy grail is subscription, right? Yep. Subscription is like, hey, if I can sell this one thing to customers every single month, like in the supplement business, right? If I'm selling a supplement and they put mm -hmm. it on there, subscribe and save, and now I have people ordering it on autopilot every single month, man, that's hugely valuable. In right. real estate, it's the same thing. I'm signing 12-month leases to people that uh, are now living in the apartments and they're paying me every single month like clockwork. So the revenue is very predictable. You know, I don't yep. have to, I don't have to go find my customer again every single month. So once I have a property that already has a high occupancy, that is very very valuable and I think this is exactly why multifamily real estate in particular is valued so high, right? There's it's so such a marketable asset because mm -hmm. of that predictable revenue that you can also predict, oh, you know what? Many of these people will never move for three, five years and yep. I'm going to be able to increase their, their revenue and the rent. And now I have a higher valuation of the property. Mm -hmm. So, you know, another big thing too is a lot of these properties are under marketed. They're under managed and, uh, you know, their, their websites are terrible. Their customer service is terrible. In just these things that we learn in e-commerce that are like paramount, right? You have to have a good customer experience. This They, is what I, I just wanted to ask next. Yeah, yeah. customer experience, a really good topic. Um, um, how, how do you compare the customer experience in e-commerce with the customer experience in, in retail? Yeah, look, I, one of the things that I think the real estate industry is very behind on is You know, many times these uh, property managers and these property owners, they're not very good adopters of technology. They're, they're late adopters of technology. And also, they don't train their teams properly to really take care of people quickly, efficiently, and uh, they make people struggle. So what happens is like in any business, people are going to gravitate to whoever gives them the better customer experience, whoever services them faster, even if they have to pay a little more, right? Mm. Like, like, I'll tell you my own experience. Like, if I, if I have a choice between buying something on Amazon versus buying something on a Shopify store or buying something on eBay, if I know that on Amazon I've had consistently a better experience, my package arrives super quick and uh, my credit card's already in there and I don't have to struggle, I'll pay a few bucks more for that mm. convenience, for that customer service, for that possibility of me returning the item and not having to worry about it. So when you talk about real estate and we talk about operations, it's exactly the same thing, right? If you live in an apartment and something breaks, if they take three weeks to fix it, then you know, you know, you know as soon as my lease is up, I'm out. But if they come between 10, 24 hours, 48 hours, take care of you with a smile, then you know what? I'm going to renew next time because I know that somewhere else they might not treat me this way. Or when I, yep. when I fall, I, you know, I answer with a smile. This is why we all like to start a five-star hotels, right? Because they treat us with good service. So that's what I've done on my properties. I've implemented five-star service so that my customers, aka my tenants, are very, very happy and they want to not only live there right now, but renew time and time again, and more importantly, refer other people to the property because they brag about how well we treat them. It's very simple, man. And it doesn't cost a lot more to treat people right 
than to offer mediocre service, which is, if you think about it, what a lot of properties do. Yeah, and you need to do the service anyway. So yeah. uh, the people do not care if you do it now or, uh, or if you do it in 14 days, you need to do it. But if you do it now and you do it with a smile, that really is the perfect case. And this is really something um, that, we, that we learn from e-commerce because it, it's exactly as you said. You, you love to buy on Amazon because the service, you know that the service is perfect. Mm -hmm. You get the packages in time. Otherwise, the vendor uh, would be blocked on Amazon. So you know that the package will come in time. You know that you can return it. You know that if you write the support chat uh, on Amazon, that the support chat is always trying to help you with a smile. And this is really something uh, that, that, that yeah can be implemented actually in any company and it can be translated to other businesses. Oh, yeah. This is very, very interesting learning um, and, and hopefully implemented in a lot of e-commerce stores already. Support is the key to success, actually, not only the price. And um, yeah, yeah, of course, the quality of the product needs to be good and, 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 and everything needs to be nice and sweet but, uh, and look beautiful. But actually, um, it's, it's always later on the support that keeps you a customer for a very long time. Um, is there anything else you learned from e-commerce and can translate to the real estate business? Yeah, you know, I think the communication is huge. You know, we, mm -hmm. we use systems to communicate quickly with people and people like answers to their questions fast. And I think that's one of the big things I'll tell you when I find properties that I am purchasing or acquiring many mm -hmm. times, the simplest things are what moves the needle the most. I'm going to tell you in particular, a property that I bought last year. So I bought this beautiful property in Tennessee. It's a 54 unit apartment complex, luxury apartment complex with businesses at the bottom. So there's clinics, there's a Morgan Stanley financial advisor uh, office, there's a plastic surgeon, there's a med spa, there's many businesses that are tenants of ours. And when I bought it, a beautiful product, the seller that was also the developer of that property had kept the property in great shape. But one of the things that they didn't do is they didn't do any marketing. Like this property, even though it's in one of the best locations in the city, in front of a very big hospital, a 15 million patient a year hospital. So just imagine the location, the traffic, you know, incredible location. And that's paramount in real estate, the location of your property. But what had happened is like nobody knew that there was units for rent available in this property, especially oh, in the really? space. So when I was looking at data, and this is where, where e-commerce really has served me really well in the real estate space, I was looking at the, at the commercial occupancy of the city. And I discovered that it was 4%. So only 4% vacancy in the whole city for commercial spaces. So that means very high demand, right? Because 96% of commercial spaces in that city are occupied. But when you looked at this complex, at this multifamily business complex, he had 66% vacancy on the commercial spaces, right? So about more than half of the commercial spaces, which were brand new in a great location, were empty. And so I was like, you know, what's happening here? It doesn't make sense, right? If the market is 4% and he's at 6%, uh, 66%, there's that big delta. And it, yeah. was, it was purely that, you know, I started looking online. There was no ads for the, for the units online. He had not hired a commercial broker to push the units. Really, it was, it was really not marketed at all. And that was one of the things that I was like, you know what? This almost seems too good to be true. But at the end of the day, what I did is I went and asked a whole bunch of real estate people in that town and said, you know what? We know the property. But uh, it is the best kept secret of this town. So sure enough, man, after I closed on that deal and I started actually advertising, promoting and letting people know that this place existed, within just six months, we signed three leases for commercial units that are worth $7 million in value for the property. So in just one year alone, Insane. we've increased the value of this property by $9 million in one year. 
that's that's really high. Wow, congratulations on that. And that's uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's also the same in e-commerce. If you are there and if you have a good product and maybe a good support, yes. but you don't do any marketing, well, it will not sell. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. If nobody knows you, nobody, nobody can give you their money. Yeah. yeah. And and I think this is something that, yeah, really a lot of um, even those the smaller brick and mortar stores that are going online since um, actually Corona. I mean that there was so many brick and mortar stores, at least here in, in in Europe, that had no online presence and didn't sell online at all or did not sell on marketplaces. They started to come online. They put it, the products online, but they forgot to do some advertising on them. Uh, yeah. So if nobody sees you. You cannot sell it. And it's the same when you open up a brick and mortar local store and you do not advertise your store in different channels. Nobody will visit you. Yeah? Just the ones that come that cross by accidentally. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, ex that's exactly it. It was all organic, right? There was really no push whatsoever. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in, in a business like real estate, you know, the, we're, we're signing for commercial spaces, five, 10. 15 year leases. So just think about the value of a 15 year contract on the that's, property that's long. Awesome. for a medical spa. You know what I mean? That, that is just in you front have... of a hospital. So a very good location I... for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, one question, uh, that, that I need to ask, I mean, uh, I don't know if, if it's the same in, um, in, in real estate, uh, than it is on uh, e-commerce, but integration automation. Is this something that is important for, for real estate or is it also only important for e-commerce and other business side of things? No, you know, that, that was one of the things that we did with our properties is we created uh, CRM systems mm -hmm. so that we have customer relationship management with our tenants, but also for our people that are looking to maybe inquire about the property, uh, come schedule a tour, come do those things. You know, that by and large in the real estate industry still today. It's very, very uh, organic. It's very on the phone. It's very, there's no automation. There's no like, like seamless integration of things. So what we did is we took the experience from our e-commerce companies and we brought it over and we're constantly testing new things, right? We're constantly trying new things so that now if somebody inquires about the property, they get a whole bunch of information up front someone in our team gets notified a phone call is generated so that they're like hey you know i saw you inquired about the property are you interested in coming in and scheduling a tour and that happens not only via phone call but happens via text happens via email right so that automation helps us be fast and that's one yep. thing that really sets you apart like i my saying is always money loves speed right and if you are there quickly, then you have a better chance of capturing that prospect and turning that prospect into a customer. And, you know, especially when people are looking for renting an apartment or renting a commercial unit, if you don't give them quick response, they just go look somewhere else. And I see yes. so many other properties where people call in on the, or they send an email and man, it takes them three days, four days a week to get back to people. It's almost like they don't want to do business. So that's what sets us apart is like, you know, if you inquire in one of our properties, you're going to get a phone call within an hour sometimes, if not within just a couple hours. So people are like, whoa, that's cool. I'm not used to this, uh, but yeah, I like it, right? I want to I, I wanna know more. And many times because of the type of product that we sell, right, I, I focus on on class A luxury properties, which for me, it's a lot of an easier sell than me trying to sell a very low cost apartment to somebody. But when people come and visit, they don't need to go shop around 10 more properties, right? If they saw the properties nice, if they like the location, if they like the amenities and you give them great customer service, many times they make a decision right there and say, okay, let's do it. Let's sign a lease. So that's yeah, and, uh, helped. And and that's that's also some uh, that the what you said before to be fast and to to have everything on file and really react and have automation. This is really something taken from e-commerce and that 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 that, that you can fully um, um, use also on real estate. And you are very right. It's not also not not only in your 
um, uh, region. Uh, and it, we, we also see it here. When you ask for something like that, you typically don't get a phone call immediately. It takes, yeah, it takes several days and we are used to that. Yeah. If someone suddenly jumps in with the experience from a complete other world where this is usual case, yeah, um, and brings that experience, you really can change the way on selling properties to, to people or, um, uh, to, to, to companies. And it's great. Um, we learned really much today. Thank you so much, Carlos. But one last question uh, that I always ask. Who has taught you the most about e-commerce in your career? Look, uh, I think in the beginning, because I started way back when there was no YouTube, there was no blogs, there was no masterminds, there was nothing. I mean, it was me, man. And it was trial and error, making money, losing money, making money, losing money. But one of the big difference makers in my career in my business was at some point I got tired of the knocking myself against the wall trying to do it myself and I started seeking mentorship I started looking for people that could help me and that were more successful than me so you know I think my first mastermind my first e-commerce mastermind was probably over 10 years ago and uh, in that room I met uh, very successful people in the space that uh, we all collaborated and we shared best practices. And, you know, um, it was interesting because that was also the birth of my logistics business because I was in a room with successful e-commerce entrepreneurs. We were all sharing our, our knowledge. You know, I had to pay a lot of money for this mastermind. Um, I started with a $25,000 mastermind, then escalated to a $100,000 mastermind. But I can tell you that money that I invested in these groups was the best money I ever spent because out of there, I created multiple seven-figure businesses and, of course, my eight-figure exit uh, for the company that I told you. And also, my logistics business was born because I realized in this room that I was the only guy with a 50,000 square feet warehouse. And uh, <laughs> Right? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I know. I hear you going. No. Yeah. And, like, and, and I was like, uh, I, I thought I was normal. Because, you know, I was, I was in the, in the, I, I started in the era where you needed a warehouse, but a lot of these folks had started when FBA was already a thing. So they never needed a warehouse. Yeah. But one of the things that really is a gap in businesses is, as you know, if people are importing products from China or they're bringing it from anywhere else, you cannot send every single one of those to Amazon, right? You can send some. But if you have a lot of stock, because and sometimes you buy a lot of stock to take advantage of price discounts, they need to hold it somewhere else. So when I started talking about, you know, me fulfilling my own products when when I need to sell in some of the channels, they're like, hey, can you hold my can you hold my inventory? Can I send you a container? Can you uh, warehouse my stuff and then send it to Amazon? And, you know, the first time somebody asked me that I had never done it. And so I'm like, you know what? Let me give you an answer tomorrow. And I went and did my research and I'm like, I mean, wh what are people charging for this? And the next day I had a price list that I had created overnight. And I said, yeah, man, here's the, here's the, here's the, here's the costs. And he's like, man, these are great. Let's go. I have three containers coming into the port of Long Beach. I need to put two in your warehouse and uh, the other one I'm going to send to Amazon. And that was the birth 10 years ago of the logistics business that I now have about 300 customers that fulfill inventory warehouse and we do all kinds of things for our business um in there and of course we service ourselves but that was another thing that led me into real estate because it's interesting and and if you think about it this way this is why amazon has put so many distribution facilities all over the the world yeah who, who pays for that real estate the the fba sellers right yeah, absolutely. The, the FBA sellers are paying storage fees, fulfillment fees, inventory inventory fees, all these fees that translate into them building warehouses. So I went from me bearing the cost of my warehouse to now every single box that I warehouse at my facility pays rent. And uh, they don't pay rent by the square foot. They pay rent by the cubic foot. So now I went from... Uh, warehouse that cost me money 
to a free warehouse and then eventually a warehouse that actually produces me money every month. So my customers paid for my real estate and that was the Amazon play. And that's exactly what I'm doing in the real estate space. So that was kind of the, the intro to the real estate space because your tenants pay for your real estate at the end of the day. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Carlos. This was an amazing interview and I think we all learned a lot. Uh, and I really, um, I, I love the stories from people that started early and needed to learn everything by themselves. So um, try and fail and try again and fail again and try again. So this really is something where you put so much effort and so much love in it that it finally turns out to the good. And you see it clearly when, 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 when we listen to your story that this happened exactly to you. You were successful on eBay, on Amazon, now in real estate, and you learned from every game um, uh, that you played a lot and used it again. And this is really um, the, 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 the lovely story about e-commerce uh, that we all can do this. Thanks so much for your time. Thank and you, good luck with your companies. Thanks, man. It's been a uh, pleasure. Thanks so much. Take Thank care. Thank you. And if you liked it, guys, um, just hit the five-star button, right? <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. And that's it for this episode of the Ecom Ops Podcast. If you enjoyed listening and would like us to find and interview more e-commerce operations experts, please search for Ecom Ops Podcast in your favorite podcast listening app and then subscribe, rate, and review. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>